Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, it's nice to see a good audience, including a lot of younger people tonight. It's really excellent uh, for tonight's John Innes, uh, uh, tonight's Innes Lecture, which is to be given by Dr. Alex Aylward from the University of Oxford. Um, the, the Innes Lecture was established in 2015 to highlight historical perspectives of um, the science that's made John Innes famous throughout the world, plant and microbial sciences and especially genetics. And um, we are very grateful to the John Innes Foundation for funding these lectures and also for the, um, the Foundation Historical Collection. And uh, I'm very glad to see that Peter Innes is here tonight representing the trustees. And um, thank you so much for the funding of the hist his history of science activities at the John Innes. Thank you. Um, my name is David Hopwood. I'm an honorary fellow here. And I've been asked to introduce the lecture because I'm old enough to have known Ronald Fisher when I was an undergraduate in Cambridge in the early 1950s. Um, I was studying botany and zoology for the degree. Um, the botany school had a strong tradition in genetics. They always had a, le a lecture in genetics on the faculty and genetics formed quite a major part of the syllabus for the botany degree. The zoology department, on the other hand, didn't. It, it never had a card-carrying geneticist on the faculty, and genetics didn't fe feature in the syllabus for the zoology degree. So they salved their conscience by inviting Fisher to come and give a lecture in the Lent term, that's the, the spring term, um, and on, Friday, on Monday afternoons at five o'clock. and. Um, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a compulsory part of the degree, it was, it was optional. The, um, the part one lecture theatre in, the, in the zoology department where the, the lectures were held, held a couple of hundred people or so, and it was just about full for Fisher's first lecture, uh, at which he spent going very slowly through some very elementary biological details of crosses, life cycles, gametes, meiosis, and so on. Um, all pretty simple stuff. Then for the second lecture, it was quite different. He spent the time going very rapidly through a whole lot of algebra, almost talking to himself. It wasn't at all obvious how it fitted in with genetics or, or indeed anything else to most of us. So um, for the third lecture, there were only about 20 people left in the lecture theatre. Um, the front row was occupied by the whole of the genetics department, uh, which was about 10 people. There were two or three lecturers, some, a couple of graduate students and some technicians. So they were on the front row and then the rest of us were scattered around in the, in the lecture theatre. Um, Fisher had glasses like the bottom of a beer bottle and um, probably couldn't see much beyond the front row anyway. So, uh, he was mainly lecturing to the, to the department. Um, I stuck it out for the, um, the rest of the term, and at the end of the term, I, I had a, about half a page of scrappy notes. But I, I felt, I mean, I really felt that I'd been in the presence of a genius. I mean, there was a, such a, a feeling. Um, he, was, um, he made much of his analysis of the rhesus blood group system in, in humans. He would proposed that it was controlled by a, a complex locus, th three closely linked um, loci with, with two variants at each, making eight possible combinations. And six of them, only six of them, had been found. Uh, and his, his theory was criticized as a result. But he came in very excited in one of the later lectures saying, they found the seventh one. And um, pretty soon, I think, the, I think the eighth was discovered a little bit after that. Um, human geneticists were 
very much uh, concerned with uh, human blood groups at that time. I mean, they made very good Mendelian markers. And um, at one of the lectures, he had a doctor come in at the end of the lecture and take blood from us. And then uh, the last lecture, we got a card with our blood group profile for about 10 different systems, the ABO, Rhesus, Lewis, Duffy, Kell, some quite rare blood group antigens. Um, it wasn't really obvious why, why he'd done that, possibly to show that even with a small number of variants, everybody was different in the class, and um, so there was plenty of variation for natural selection to, um, to uh, work on. Let's see. Um, Yes, the, the genetics department was um, in a private house called Whittingham Lodge. It had been um, Reginald Punnett's home. He was the co-discoverer with Becky Saunders and um, William Bateson, who was the first director of the John Innes, of genetic linkage. Um, and um, they had a sort of open house during the long vacation term, so I went there several times, and then I think I... I think I remember going to one or two seminars there. The whole house stank of mouse urine because uh, all the b former bedrooms were, were full of mouse cages. Uh, you didn't need a home office license then to, uh, with all kinds of biosecurity or everything. The mice were just sort of stacked up in, the, in these former bedrooms. So that, that was the house. And then the garden was occupied by flower beds containing Lithrum salicaria, the purple loose trife which Fisher was working on. It's an autotetraploid, which that means there are four identical sets of chromosomes, homologous sets of chromosomes, rather than just two in a typical diploid. So the genetics is quite complex, um, and Fisher was, was working on the genetics of polyploids, um, including a phenomenon called double reduction, which I think I understood at the time, but uh, I couldn't reproduce now. Um, <laughs> I didn't read Fisher's book, which is listed up there, um, but I was told by Walter Bodmer. Walter Bodmer went on to be a, um, a giant of um, genetics and statistics himself. He, he said that he thought that almost any page of this book could be worked up into a PhD thesis. Um, uh, Bodmer had done part three mathematics before doing part two genetics. You, you almost had to do um, mathematics or physics as a prerequisite if you were going to do part two um, genetics because of Fisher's statistical interests. I mean, some years they, they got one student on the course. Occasionally, I think they had as many as five. Um, um, so... Evidently, the, the book is a work of genius, but it had a darker side, and that's what we're going to be hearing about tonight. So Alex Aylward, our Innes lecturer, was an undergraduate in Cambridge, went on to do a, a PhD there in history and philosophy of science. Um, that was followed by... Uh, no, you, you did your PhD in Leeds, didn't you? Yeah, you did your master's in, in Cambridge and then a PhD in Leeds and um, became very interested in um, Fisher. And your, your research is focused on the history of evolutionary biology, genetics, and eugenics. And um, you've made a special study of Fisher's utterances. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing all about it tonight. So um, this is the title of Alex's lecture. So please joining, join me in... Um, Welcoming Alex to the podium. Thank you, David, for the introduction. Hi, everybody. Many thanks to all of you uh, for coming out this evening. Uh, so many more than I could have hoped for. Um, Thanks to Sarah Wilmot as well, wherever you are, for, um, for inviting me to give this lecture. It's a real honor and a real pleasure to be here. 
um, and to be able to share some of the fruits of my historical research with you all tonight. Um, I always relish the opportunity to share my work with scientists, um, to talk with scientists, so many of whom are so passionate and knowledgeable about the histories of their fields. Um, and it's, uh, as David mentioned, a real pleasure to see so many young people here tonight as well, um, perhaps scientists of the future or indeed historians of science of the future, if I do my job well. Fisher was never on the staff here at the Innes Centre, but he did visit regularly. And he maintained a deep interest in the work going on here, given his own researches in genetics and statistics. The latter was often developed actually in service of designing and analyzing agricultural experiments. Um, this is Fisher at a summer school held at the Innes Centre in 1938. He worked closely with um, Cyril Dean Darlington, pictured here, whose long association with the Inner Centre included serving as director through the 1940s and early 50s. And during that time, Fisher and Darlington established a new journal, a new journal of genetics called Heredity, which later became the official journal of the Genetics Society. And that's an organisation whose archives are held here, looked after expertly by Sarah. Um, so the connections run deep with Fisher and the Innes. Like Darlington, in certain ways, Fisher's legacy today is a mixed one. On the 7th of June, 2020, amidst global Black Lives Matter protests, a petition went live on change.org, calling for the removal of a stained glass window from Gonville and Keys College in Cambridge. The window had been installed in honor of Fisher. Fisher, the giant of statistics, genetics, and evolutionary theory. And Fisher, the former student, fellow, and president of Gomel and Keyes College. At issue within this, uh, within this campaign were Fisher's views on race and his active support for eugenics. And within just a couple of weeks, the college's council had voted to remove the Fisher window. At University College London, where Fisher also spent some of his career, uh, in the Biosciences Division, the RA Fisher Centre for Computational Biology was renamed the UCL Centre for Computational Biology. Fisher's name removed. Various other institutions and learned societies around the world took the decision to retire or to rename their R.A. Fisher lectureship or prize. When this campaign unfolded, I was quite a good way into a doctoral research project at the University of Leeds. It was a doctoral research project in the history of science, and it happened to take as its focus Fisher's famous book, of 1930, The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, which is pictured here on the slide. And I was doing a history of science project, but I was borrowing from the toolkits of historians of the book and historians of reading. And the project examined the writing of this book, uh, the publication of this book, its reception and its circulation among readers as well as its longer run legacies. So it's an attempt really to write a long history of a single scientific book. And today I want to share with you some of the key findings of that research. Findings which I hope you'll agree add significantly to our understanding of this classic scientific text, but which also I hope illuminate some of the key issues at play in the discourse and debate surrounding Fisher's legacies, and also the legacies of eugenics, more generally. To begin then, I'll, I'll introduce the book itself, which may not be familiar to, to many of you here. I'll give a brief indication of the book's structure and its contents, and outline the place that this text ha has within the controversy and the, and the debate surrounding Fisher and his eugenics. <clears throat> 
I'll then offer overviews of some of my key research findings. Firstly, relating to the writing of this book, its composition, and secondly, to its reception and its circulation among readers. And finally, I'll conclude with some reflections on the book's longer legacies. And throughout, I'll be asking how studying the genetical theory in this way, tracing the long history of this one scientific book, can illuminate the ongoing and very live controversy over Fisher's eugenics. So let's familiarize ourselves a little with this book. On the left are the three editions of the genetical theory of natural selection, published in 1930, 1958, and finally 1999. By the time the second edition appeared in 58, and certainly by the time of the final edition at the close of last century, Fisher's book was widely celebrated as among the most important texts on evolutionary theory, perhaps second only to Darwin's Origin of Species. In particular, the genetical theory is lauded today as one of the foundational works of the so-called modern synthesis. And this reputation specifically is built upon the book's earlier chapters in which Fisher worked to reconcile Darwin's theory of natural selection with the new Mendelian genetics. And he attempted to show how mathematical and statistical techniques could be used to analyze evolutionary processes. I'm not gonna to say too much tonight about the detailed content of these chapters. I'll be focused somewhat more on the final five chapters in which Fisher turned his attention to humans. And he asked why throughout history, all great civilizations eventually collapse and decay. He blamed the overfertile lower classes who outbred their social and, Fisher assumed, biological superiors. And Fisher wanted to prevent Britain from suffering the same fate as great empires of the past. And so in the last chapter, Fisher proposed a system of children's allowances designed to encourage breeding among the more biologically desirable middle and upper classes. The content and the nature of these chapters and their presence within Fisher's masterwork is one of the things which the Fisher Must Fall campaign, which we just met, has pointed to when problematizing the continued celebration and memorialization of Fisher. But this isn't a new controversy, and these aren't new debates. Um, the, the controversy surrounding these chapters and what they mean for how we understand Fisher and his work has a much longer history. Through the 1970s and early 80s, the historian of science Bernard Norton at London and then at Leicester, and the scholar Donald Mackenzie, who was based at Edinburgh. Between them authored a sort of mini literature of their own in which they uncovered the extent and depth of Fisher's commitment to eugenical ideology and argued that this commitment, this um, extra scientific influence in Norton's language, both had motivated Fisher's move from mathematics and, and statistics, which is what he studied as an undergraduate at Gomel and Keyes College, for Fisher to move from maths and statistics into genetics and evolution, this, this very choice on Fisher's part was motivated by his eugenical commitments, according to Norton and Mackenzie. But more than that, they argued that Fisher's concern with eugenics, with improving the quality of the population, actually determined the very content of his science, of his biological theorizing. And this was a thesis developed in the context of the so-called strong program for the sociology of knowledge, which was gaining a foothold at this time, uh, mostly in, uh, based out of Edinburgh, where, where Mackenzie was based. In the middle here is Donald Mackenzie's book, Statistics in Britain, 1865 to 1930, subtitled The Social Construction of Scientific Knowledge. And that gives a, a flavor of the kind of uh, argument that Mackenzie was trying to, to put forward, that uh, 
social and political matters could actually shape uh, the, very, the very nature of scientific knowledge itself. And Fisher is the subject of an extended case study in chapter eight of that book. And in this book and elsewhere, Mackenzie and Norton pointed explicitly to the genetical theory of natural selection and its final five chapters as key evidence of Fisher's eugenic convictions, convictions which in turn shaped the ideas of the book's first half, its purportedly scientific half. And these kinds of claims about the relationship between society and science, politics and science, and about the genetical theory's second half and its first half in particular, these claims became quickly accepted and often repeated within the literature that historians of science were producing throughout this period. And the genetical theory with its, with its two halves, the scientific half and the eugenical, political, ideological half, became a convenient kind of shorthand for claims about the shaping of science by ideology, both in the case of Fisher, but also in the case of the modern sciences more generally. So take, for example, this remark from 1989 by historian and philosopher of science, Michael Ruse, and he alludes to the famous Edinburgh School of the Sociology of Knowledge, which uh, Mackenzie was a part of. And he writes that one does not have to have an Edinburgh accent to think that Fisher is fertile ground for either historian and philosopher. In one man, we have a perfect case study to test all sorts of theses about the ways in which culture and values can get into straight science, and conversely. And if you doubt what I say, you need only look at his seminal, The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, the first two thirds of which creates modern evolutionary theory, and the last third of which is full of helpful hints about keeping up the human breeding stock. But at the same time, several of Fisher's former students and colleagues and other admirers of his science have consistently and strongly objected to Norton and Mackenzie's claims. They've instead tried to downplay the extent of Fisher's eugenic convictions, as well as the relevance of those convictions to Fisher's science. For example, another fellow of Gonville and Keyes College, Anthony Edwards, who studied undergraduate genetics under Fisher in the 50s, one of the very few students um, that did so, as we heard from David. Edwards took aim at Mackenzie's book. Um, he wrote a review of Mackenzie's book, Statistics in Britain. Um, and Edwards, in that review, protested that Fisher's eugenics, and in, indeed the whole of his views on the interaction of genetics and human society, manifest in the later chapters of the genetical theory of natural selection, are rooted in his science and not the other way around. Fisher is not good material for sociologists. The Australian geneticist Henry Bennett, who completed his PhD in Cambridge under Fisher's direction, defended a similar line in 1983. Bennett edited a collection of Fisher's letters, which he published, and in the introduction to that collection, Bennett wrote, all the evidence from Fisher's published work, his biography, and his correspondence shows, I believe, that his biological interests were primarily in natural selection, secondly in heredity, and that from these stemmed his interests in human heredity and eugenics. So it wasn't eugenics which drove science, Fisher's scientific interests. Rather, he was interested in the science and applied that to his current political moment. Um, but the science was primary for Fisher. As the historian of science James Moore has observed, Fisher's students and his scientific followers were concerned with preserving what they felt was their hero's ideological purity. Now, when it comes to the genetical theory of natural selection, those who seek to defend Fisher's legacy from the taint of eugenics have often fallen back on a couple of common wisdoms. And in the, in the bulk of this talk now, what I'll be doing is, is putting some pressure on those, on those common wisdoms. 
So one of these common wisdoms concerns the writing of the genetical theory of natural selection, how this book was composed. We have just one brief account of the composition of the genetical theory. It comes in a biography of Fisher, which was published in 1978, which was 16 years after his death. And it was written by Joan Fisher Box, one of his daughters. It's worth quoting at length. Box writes, although much of the thought involved in the genetical theory of natural selection dated back to the early 1920s, and some at least to his college days, it wasn't until the autumn of 1928 that Fisher began to write the book. Once he had, had embarked on it, however, he wrote with remarkable rapidity. Like his other genetical work, it was done at home with his wife. He would stride about the room or mull over a pipe as he dictated, and she took down his words in long hand. Apart from the mathematical chapters four and five, the whole book was written in this way by dictation between October 1928 and June 1929. In June, the whole thing was in the hands of the publisher. She goes on, Fisher seemed to know exactly what he wished to say, holding the whole ordered argument in his head. And even his deliberation over the detailed expression of his thoughts did not often give pause to the pen of his amanuensis. Yet, once he had set down a passage on paper, he rarely changed a word or needed to rearrange the order or insert omissions. His capacity to hold in mind the numerous details of a complex argument was remarkable as was his precision in expressing what he meant. This vivid reconstruction quickly entered Fisherian folklore. It was taken up and habitually retold and retold by Fisher's scientific disciples. Those who conversed with him will understand, wrote the population geneticist J.F. Crow, after recounting with approval Box's anecdote. He goes on, he spoke in slow, measured words, complete sentences and organized paragraphs. Once the passage was dictated, he hardly ever changed a word. For those who counted Fisher among their scientific heroes, th this story from Box's biography merely confirmed what they already knew about the man and about his great book. With the revelation of its unusual composition, the genetical theory became more than ever a testament to the author's peculiar genius. Fisher becomes almost a disembodied intellect. Words flow unencumbered from the mind of the genius to the page via his scribe, and they're never to be altered. We'll find cause to put pressure on this picture. We'll also challenge Box's timeline, according to which the whole book was penned by dictation across a feverish few months in late 1928 through to early 1929. Box's account, which hasn't really been questioned up until now. The human chapters within this account get barely a mention, and it's implied that they were written hurriedly at the very end. Now, some of Fisher's would-be defenders have taken this to imply that the eugenic portion was something of an afterthought. It was a misguided but ultimately unimportant extrapolation from the properly scientific earlier chapters. So compared with the earlier chapters, Fisher didn't take the human portion all that seriously, and neither should we. But there's a problem. Before COVID hit, I was fortunate enough to, to visit Fisher's personal archive held in the special collections at the University of Adelaide in South Australia, which is where Fisher spent his final years. And in the archive, I came across a document, a couple of pages of which are pictured here on the slide. This document was among Fisher's assorted notes and unpublished drafts. And it turns out that this document, which Fisher wrote in the summer of 1919, aged 29, is really rather interesting. It's interesting in one sense for the pressure that it puts on this mythologized image of Fisher as author, where he never changed a word once he'd committed it to the page. As we can see from this page on the right, that's simply not true. It's covered in penciled amendments, uh, scribblings, uh, striking through whole sentences, rewriting them. The image we get of Fisher as author cannot be right. 
Throughout the writing process, he frequently struggled to articulate his meaning. He made authorial compromises. He edited harshly. He consigned drafts to the dustbin and started over again. So it can make us all feel a bit better about how difficult it is to write sometimes. But it's also interesting, this document, because it amounts, what it amounts to is the first three chapters of a would-be but never published book in which Fisher sets out at length his pet eugenical theory of the decay of civilizations. He opens his account here, not with Darwin or with Mendel, as he would do in his published 1930 book, but as we can see, with a discussion of the inequalities in the rate of increase of people of different nations, races, and social classes. Comparing this archival document from 1919 with the genetical theory of natural selection is really instructive. I've tried, perhaps not very elegantly, to indicate the relationship between the two here on the slide. So the manuscript, the archival manuscript's first chapter summarizes a range of demographic studies, all of which confirm the uncomfortable fact, uncomfortable for the eugenicist, that, quote, the lower orders of society are reproducing their kind at a rate greatly exceeding that of their social superiors. So left unchecked, this process would surely, for the eugenicist, lead to a steady degradation in the quality of the national stock. Britain's future looked bleak. In the second chapter, Fisher hoped to demonstrate that this variation in human fertility, the differences in reproductive output, observable between different social classes, was at least in part a heritable variation. And if fertility itself is genetically heritable, then it stands to reason that it may be acted upon by natural selection. The third chapter runs with this possibility, arguing that in what Fisher calls civilized societies, low fertility is socially selected. That is, those individuals who are congenitally, naturally, inherently, biologically less fertile tend, all things being equal, to rise up the social scale. Why? Because small families are socially advantageous. Parents can give a better start in life to fewer children. Inherited wealth is split among fewer heirs. Genes making for, for relative infertility will then, over time, percolate up into the higher social grades. And here's the problematic bit from the eugenicist's perspective. These genes making for infertility will combine through sexual reproduction with genes in other individuals making for eugenically desirable traits like inheritance, which of course Fisher believed were more common as you ascend the social scale. Over generations then, the natural endowments of the brightest and the best would be effectively bred out of the population as intelligence and civic worth genetically determined, combine with genetically determined infertility. With this theory of the social selection of fertility, Fisher believed he'd isolated the cause not only of Britain's own dysgenic birth rate, but also an explanation of the decline and collapse of all great civilizations throughout history. Now, Anyone familiar with Fisher's 1930 book, and I don't know if anybody, any of you are, but if you are, you'll recognize that this is the argument in outline which Fisher sets out in his notorious final five chapters. And there he shuffled his pack slightly, as you can see by the overlapping arrows. He added a couple of extra chapters as well. One, to start off, introducing this historical phenomenon of civilizational collapse throughout human history, and a final chapter, Conditions of Permanent Civilization, in which he detailed his proposed solution to this problem. His solution was a system of family allowances, inspired by reading the social reformer Eleanor Rathbone. Family allowances weighted to salary, designed to nullify the social advantage of small families and the resultant 
upward spread of genes making for relative infertility. The more you earned, the bigger family allowance you would get. But it isn't just that the argument was already in place in the summer of 1919 when Fisher wrote this document. The correspondences between these two documents go beyond the thematic or the conceptual. In many places, the very wording is identical, leafing through the 1919 typescript. One can locate on almost every page or passage a phrase which would recur entirely or largely unchanged in the 1930 book. Very often the recycling of this old material was more extensive, very extensive indeed, with several consecutive pages worth of text being lifted wholesale and incorporated verbatim in the new work. So for example, his discussion of, the, uh, of Francis Galton's theory of the relative infertility of the upper classes, his theory of the infertile heiress, which occurs in chapter 11 um, of the genetical theory, as well as his criticisms of Arthur de Gobineau's ideas on the civilizational dangers of race mixing later in that chapter. These are just two examples among, among many where Fisher lifted extended passages from his 1919 typescript. Uh, and reproduced them in his 1930 book with little change. Indeed, no change in some cases. So the genetical theory's human chapters began life far earlier than the standard account that we get from Box allows. And they started almost a decade before the rest of the book, having first been conceived and composed in the guise of a standalone work on the decay of civilizations. It was only in 1922 that Fisher began to consider authoring a work on the mathematics of evolution, a project which it appears he conceived as entirely distinct from the earlier false start on civilizations. And some point in the mid to late 1920s, it's difficult to pin down exactly, Fisher evidently decided to roll the two book projects into one and to repurpose these old drafts of his eugenical theory as the closing chapters of an otherwise technical scientific tome which detailed his mathematical and statistical investigations of natural selection in Mendelian populations. And he attempted to smooth the seam in his preface where he writes that the human material is inseparable from the rest. Clearly not. It was written separately and substantially earlier. The genetical theory, you might say, was written backwards. Fisher began at the end perhaps revealing his ends. Another piece of common wisdom about the genetical theory's human chapters is that essentially nobody took any notice of them. There are plenty of examples of this kind of claim floating around the scientific literature. These two both occur within reviews of the 1919 edition of the genetical theory. There's a common pattern the early chapters are exalted as revolutionary, path-breaking, ahead of their time, but what to say about those pesky final five? Crow writes, Fisher's last five chapters deal with the human condition. He regarded these as inseparable from the rest of the text. Readers have thought otherwise, and these chapters have been largely ignored. Whereas most of the book was far ahead of its time, this part seems curiously dated. Charlesworth writes, this section seems generally to be ignored or regarded as an embarrassment and is frankly tedious to read. Now, a significant part of my research has involved locating and inspecting surviving copies of the genetical theory of natural selection in various libraries and collections around the UK and also further afield. And by examining the marginalia and other annotations in copies of the first edition, I've been able to reconstruct some of the ways that this book was actually used and read. And what emerges very clearly is that, especially through the 1930s and 1940s, readers absolutely did not ignore the final chapters. Here's just one example. Heavily annotated pages from the first human chapter in a copy held in Columbia University's zoology library. And any librarians might be wincing at the the amount of, um, of annotation here, so I'm not condoning it, but it's useful for me as a historian. Um, 
Looking through the earliest reviews of the genetical theory in the periodical literature, several of Fisher's reviewers actually recommended that the general reader, as they called them, might benefit from skipping over the technically demanding, heavily mathematical earlier chapters and heading straight to the human discussion, which they predicted would be of greater general interest. And indeed, there are several examples of copies in libraries and university collections where the first seven chapters of the book, the chapters which made its great scientific reputation, are pristine, seemingly untouched, while the last five are peppered with pencil marks, annotations, and underlinings. And it's not only that people read the chapters, some took them very seriously indeed. None more so than Sir William Beveridge, remembered for his 1942 report, Social Insurance and Allied Services, the blueprint for Britain's post-war welfare state. In early 1943, Beveridge read the genetical theory's closing chapters with enthusiasm. He praised Fisher's scheme of eugenical family allowances, both in private correspondence and in a couple of published articles. Beveridge encountered the genetical theory slightly too late for it to shape the kind of children's allowances which he would recommend in his famous report. It was published a few months before he read Fisher's book. In that report, he'd suggested flat rate allowances rather than the salary weighted schemes that were preferred by Fisher. But through 1943, Beveridge would advocate in various venues for some form of Fisherian weighted scheme with the aim of promoting racial progress. Not only politicians, biologists too read the final five chapters with interest. JBS Haldane, one of the other big three population geneticists alongside Fisher and the American Sewell Wright, had much to say about the chapters, both praise as well as criticism. He considered Fisher's theory of the social selection of fertility to be broadly plausible, if a little under-evidenced. But Haldane's socialist politics meant that he differed from Fisher on the policy implications. For Haldane, Fisher had shown that the very structure of British society, capitalist, hierarchical, along class lines, was in itself dysgenic, that is, the opposite of eugenic. While Fisher proposed tinkering which might achieve eugenic ends while maintaining the status quo. It was obvious to Haldane that root and branch societal reform was the only solution. Fisher's book was uh, a call for revolution in the hands of Haldane. The biologist Julian Huxley was even more enthusiastic than Haldane, at least at first. Through the early 1930s, having devoured the genetical theory in just a, a few days, including its closing chapters, Huxley became a vocal supporter of Fisher's theory of civilizational decline. He was so convinced of its significance that he wrote to the Eugenic Society asking that they came out hot and strong in support of Fisher's analysis. Haldane and Huxley engaged closely with the whole book, but notably not all at once. Each was an important interpreter and popularizer of both the evolutionary and genetical analysis in chapters one to seven, and also the eugenical theorizing of chapters eight to 12. But interestingly, they almost always treated those different book parts of the book separately, writing about them at different times in different venues for different purposes and audiences. They read it and they treated it as a book of two halves but two halves to be taken equally seriously. Haldane even suggested splitting the book into two. When Haldane reviewed the genetical theory for the Eugenics Review, the official journal of the British Eugenics Society, he ended by expressing his hope that, quote, within the next 10 years, the sections dealing with evolution and eugenics will both be rewritten in a form which demands less intellectual effort in its readers. And a part of that hope almost came to pass. These images show some letters exchanged between Fisher and his editor at the Oxford University Press from the late 1930s. After Fisher inquired, quote, whether any better use could be made of my material, 
than merely to sell the remainder of the addition at its present rate. He sensed that interest in family allowance policies was on the rise and clearly felt that there was an opportunity to gather support for his eugenically designed scheme. But sluggish sales of the book meant that his ideas weren't reaching a potentially sympathetic audience. So Fisher and his editor discussed various possibilities, including republishing the final five chapters as a standalone book or essay. But the Second World War broke out before they reached an agreement, and the whole notion was shelved. It's an intriguing what if. The Second World War often serves as a bookend. In historical narratives of eugenics, we hear again and again about the movement's swift death following World War II. According to this traditional picture, the atrocities perpetrated by the Nazis in the name of eugenics dealt the final and fatal blow to a movement which was already in terminal decline. After 1945, eugenics quickly became a dirty word, an odious idea banished to the dustbin of history. How does this watershed moment affect Fisher and the genetical theory? We've seen that the book's human chapters enjoyed healthy circulation and support throughout the 1930s and into the early 1940s. Were they shunned after the war? Well, yes and no. It's a complex picture, just as historians in recent years have complicated the picture of a sharp decline of eugenics, <clears throat> of a discontinuity. And historians have been showing how eugenic ideas persisted far longer than traditional narratives allow, and up to the present day. So let's take the journal Annals of Eugenics, which Fisher edited during his stint as Galton Professor of Eugenics at University College London through the 30s and 40s. Under Fisher's successor, Lionel Penrose, who was a sharp critic of traditional eugenics, this journal was rebranded in 1954 to become the Annals of Human Genetics which is its name to this day. The UCL Department of Eugenics and the Chair of Eugenics, which Fisher then Penrose held, was also renamed. It followed suit a few years later. On the other hand, you have the Eugenics Society, of which Fisher had been a long-serving member and on whose behalf he had campaigned tirelessly and unsuccessfully to legalize on eugenic grounds the sterilization of people deemed mentally deficient. A motion was raised in 1960 by some members of that society that they might, given the tarnishing of the word, drop eugenics from their name. After some debate, the suggestion was rejected. The name was retained until 1989, when the organization became the Galton Institute named after the, the inventor of the word eugenics, Francis Galton. In 2021, the Galton Institute rebranded once more as the Adelphi Genetics Forum. So the story of eugenics in post-war Britain is a complex mix of continuity and discontinuity. What about the genetical theory and its eugenical chapters? Well, for their part, they did actually enjoy continued circulation, attention, and citation in post-war populational studies of fertility and social mobility. Though a consensus formed relatively quickly that Fisher's ideas were invalidated by new data on human fertility and the factors affecting social mobility. And through the mid-century, references in the literature to the genetical theory's closing chapters gradually dried up as hereditarian biological explanations of differences in fertility were almost wholly dismissed in favor of social, cultural, and environmentalist accounts. The appearance in 1958 of a new edition of the Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, an inexpensive paperback published by Dover Books, pictured on the left on the slide there. Incidentally, Fisher hated this cover um, he, he thought it completely disguised the nature of what was in the book. I mean, I, I don't know 
to what extent the uh, original cover, which was just plain, really really made the contents of the book that clear either, but, but there we go. The emergence of this, of this relatively cheap paperback edition, published in much greater numbers than the original 1930 edition, brought Fisher's book potentially to a whole new audience. And notably, while preparing this edition, Fisher made revisions across the text, some of them really quite extensive, but he left the final five chapters, the eugenic chapters, pretty much unaltered. The 1999 edition calls itself a variorum edition, which means it's a, it reproduces the text of the first edition uh, with notes indicating where changes were made in the subsequent 1958 edition. So you can see where Fisher decided to update things and where he let them be. And I think it's from this point, uh, from the publication of the Dover edition onwards, that it, that it begins to be fair to say, along with the likes of Charlesworth and Crow, that the human chapters came to be overlooked. Where the 1930 edition had been read by politicians, clergymen, and essayists, as well as biological specialists, the 1958 edition was almost exclusively read by professional evolutionists. And attendant to the professionalization of evolutionary biology through the middle decades of the century was a gradual shunning of speculation, eugenic or otherwise, on man's evolutionary future. This kind of thing was reserved maybe for popular works, but usually kept out of technical scientific works, and Fisher's was certainly technical. So as the decades wore on and the genetical theory's reputation as a canonical work of evolutionary biology grew ever greater, the more curious, strange, and out of place the last chapters seemed to be, these just weren't the problems that professional evolutionary biologists dealt with. Now, of course, not of course, but you can find uh, plenty of counterexamples to that of professional evolution, evolutionists who were enamored with what Fisher had to say in the final chapters and uh, in, through this period of the latter part of the 20th century. And W.D. Hamilton, the famous evolutionary gen geneticist, is a good example of that. To start to bring things towards a close, I want to share this quote from the late, great Garland Allen, who is a notable historian of science and historian of eugenics. Um, and he passed away, sadly, last year. This remark comes in a letter which he wrote to the evolutionary biologist Ernst Meyer in 1984. And I, I came across this letter by accident in, the, in Meyer's, uh, Ernst Meyer's papers at Harvard, which I was looking at for other reasons. But it, it jumped out at me as interesting. Alan writes, it's strange how we, historians and others alike, often read what we want or are told to read and don't probe much deeper. I'm flabbergasted, for example, when I realize how long it took me to realize that the whole second half of Fisher's The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection was an apologia for eugenics. How many times I'd read through parts of that book, including even the eugenic parts, without realizing the connection. One of the great things about this remark is that it helps us to appreciate ourselves as well as earlier generations of scholars, as historically situated readers. What Alan says here helps us to recover other ways of reading Fisher's book which have now been lost or displaced. If one reads through these chapters, which you might do, um, one will struggle in vain to find Fisher referring to what he is doing as eugenics. He doesn't use that word so much in this book even when he was writing about the same ideas at the same times in eugenics journals and calling it explicitly eugenical. So in one sense, you're excused, Gar. Um, but nevertheless, nowadays, we very much conceive of the final five chapters of the genetical theory as the eugenical chapters, so much so that it's difficult to believe that anyone could have struggled to realize the connection not least a leading scholar of the eugenics movement. But between the end of World War II and the 1970s, when Mackenzie and Norton, who we met earlier, began publishing their first writings on Fisher, it wasn't all that common for historians, or anyone for that matter, to make the connection 
between Fisher's work and the eugenics movement. Readers in the 1930s, as, we see, as we've seen, had of course unthinkingly associated these chapters with the very contemporary and very popular eugenics discourse. But following the Second World War, as eugenics waned in popularity, but the genetical theory continued to circulate, to be read and to be cited, the connection became lost, buried and forgotten. Following the war, Fisher's book became overwhelmingly associated with the modern synthesis and the new discipline of evolutionary biology, which in many ways distanced itself from interwar eugenics. And this meant that Mackenzie and Norton were effectively rediscovering the eugenical reading of the book. It was surprising, as Alan's remarks demonstrate. The meaning of texts evolves continuously as they encounter new readers in novel contexts. In June 1920, uh, June 2020, not 1920. In June 2020, three weeks after the petition launched um, to remove the window, the college's council voted to do so. And that decision came just a day after the Committee of Presidents of Statistical Societies announced the retirement with immediate effect of its prestigious R.A. Fisher Award and Lectureship. These almost simultaneous moves prompted a steady stream of essays and think pieces from biologists, historians, and science writers. Some of them welcomed the decisions as necessary and overdue. Others condemned them as tantamount to the erasure of history. The result, I think, has been anything but, although, and arguably because, Fisher's window no longer throws light on a Cambridge dining hall. Scholarly and public interest in Fisher has been greater in the months and years since his defenestration than at almost any other point since his death in 1962. And I suppose this lecture is, is one proof of that. Rather than banish Fisher to unmerited obscurity, the recent controversy surrounding his memorialization has brought renewed energy and urgency to our historical re-evaluations of his life, work, and legacies. It's also induced interested parties to revisit, or in some cases, consult for the first time, the human chapters of the genetical theory of natural selection. As the American Statistical Association's leadership considered whether to rename their, their Fisher lectureship, members of that organization took to online forums to trade choice quotes and synopses. One wrote, I just skim read his book. The first 170 pages are fascinating, early statistical work on genetics. It's the last 100 pages from man and society onwards that things go awry. Another, another new reader of the genetical theory wrote on Twitter in June 2020, when the controversy was at its height. Subjected myself to the last five chapters of Fisher's 1930, The Genetical Theory. Pulled my hair out and screamed into the void. A year later, an evolutionist wrote on, again on Twitter, I'm rereading Fisher 1930 and don't recall it being quite so blatantly racist, even for a eugenicist. These re-readings of the genetical theory are, like all acts of reading, rooted in their contexts. Here, a cultural moment in which the murder of George Floyd had prompted the scientific community to reckon publicly with the legacies of scientific racism. Yet we can usefully position these re-readings within a longer history of criticism, textual scrutiny, and disputed reading, stretching back almost a century to the book's first appearance in March 1930. I want to end now by reflecting on this remark from the historian of biology, Maurizio Esposito, in a 2018 essay on the genetical theory. Esposito wants us to resist and reject the two halves reading. In their insistence upon chopping the book up, the book up in this way, as well as the desperation to expose the ideological underpinnings of Fisher's genuine scientific achievement, historians like Mackenzie and Norton, who we met, 
have lost sight of the book's underlying unity. To fully understand just what he was driving at, Esposito says, we need only to reread Fisher's book from page 1 to 265 as one unique and integrated argument, linking evolutionary biology with human evolution and therefore natural science with the human sciences. For Esposito, we should simply take the author at his word, as he said in the preface, and read the genetical theory as a unified whole. My claim, instead, is that the genetical theory is, and almost always has been, a book of two halves. And I mean this not as an assertion about what the text truly means, nor as a stipulation of how it should be read, but rather as a historical claim. Firstly, it's a historical claim about the book's origin and composition. So, although Fisher presented them as inseparable, we've seen that the genetical theory's two halves came together in a more contingent manner, as the author stitched together the working manuscripts of two separately conceived book projects. Then, several years after publication, with Fisher desperate to promote his eugenic scheme of family allowances, he and his publisher discussed the possibility of republishing some version of the chapters separately from the rest. For a fleeting few months, it seemed as though the book's two halves might go their separate ways once more. Secondly, mine is a claim about how Esposito's recent intervention notwithstanding, Fisher's book has been and continues to be read as a book of two halves. Rather than dismissing this out of hand and finding fault in it, we should see we should see all these instances as expressions of a two halves reading of the genetical theory, which is as old as the book itself. In the 1930s, reviewers and readers juxtaposed the technical mathematical early chapters with the general or accessible human discussion, reflecting the topicality and timeliness of the issues treated in those chapters. By the 1970s, the latter chapters had become political ideological in stark contrast to the scientific material of the earlier chapters. The nature, meanings, and evaluations of each half had undergone significant transformations, but their distinctness from one another remained palpable. I think that telling this long history is important, important for correcting certain myths and mistruths about this important scientific text, one of the most influential in modern biology, but important also for what light it can shed on the long-run histories of le and legacies of eugenics. Often, though not always, attempts to tell those longer histories try to trace the persistence of eugenic ideas, concepts, modes of speaking and reasoning. And my sense is that there's much to be gained by also following material legacies, what happens to objects, including printed texts. Most books of an explicitly eugenical nature, dating from the interwar period, had a relatively short shelf life. They didn't continue to enjoy much of an audience after the Second World War. And where copies of these works survive, they tend to gather dust in library stacks and storage. We saw some examples in the, in the lovely exhibition that Sarah put together. And they're rarely consulted, except perhaps by the intrepid historian or librarian or archivist. And so Fisher's genetical theory is relatively unusual among eugenical texts from this period in that it continued, indeed continues, to be read, cited and circulated long into the supposedly post-eugenics era. And by looking closely at how readers responded to its eugenical portion and how those responses changed through the post-war decades and up to today, we stand to learn much about how working biologists, as well as others, in the shadow of World War II, have negotiated the legacies of eugenics. Thanks very much for your attention. You're all still here. <laughs>
Yay! <laughs> so thank you so much for your absolutely wonderful and highly informative talk on Fisher's work on theories about genetics and also about eugenics. I'm Kelsey Byers, I'm a group leader here at the John Innes Center, and it's my absolute pleasure to host the Q&A session. I thought I might start us out while other folks think about potential questions to ask by starting out with a question about Fisher's ideas. So you, you showed us that in his 1919 drafts, he clearly was thinking about eugenics before he was necessarily working on the parts of his work about the science. Does that suggest that he really was <coughs> driven primarily by eugenics and the science followed? Do we have other evidence for that? <clears throat> yeah, that's, that gets at the really tricky question. Um, and the question which has kind of occupied historians interested in Fisher for generations now. Um, how do you, yeah, how, how do you put one primary to the other? Was it the science first or the eugenics first or the eugenics first and then the science second? It, my sort of, what I'm increasingly thinking when I try to answer that question for myself is, are we making a mistake here in drawing a line between the proper science and the eugenics that somebody like Fisher and people, other people within his, his generation simply wouldn't have recognized? And so for Fisher, when he read Darwin or when he read other evolutionary thinkers, when he read genetical literature, he was reading that as a scientist and as a eugenicist at one and the same time, applying it to the full range of problems. And eugenics was, in this period, certainly for its most, most kind of prominent advocates, was science and was continuous with these uh, areas of discourse. And so it doesn't make, I think, if we're being truly historical about it, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense to draw the line that you need to draw between those two areas of discourse in order to say that one comes primary to the other. So that's the kind of um, being ultra sort of historical and being attentive to actors' categories and the kind of things that professional historians worry about all the time. Um, and it, I think the nuance is helpful there because it helps us to recognize that the boundaries of science are movable and have moved. Um, and so where eugenics was considered part of the wider scientific discourse um, in this period, and it later moved out of that area of scientific discourse. And it's interesting to ask, well, how did that happen? How did eugenics cease to be considered legitimate science though it had been at least among certain parts of the scientific community in this period. And so I, I try to, um, I'm, I'm trying to tell that story I'm in, in my work going forward. I'm trying to ask how that boundary between eugenics and the rest of evolutionary biology and genetics moved across the 20th century. That's a kind of roundabout and not very direct answer to the question, but <laughs> I hope it's helpful. No, I think that's a really good point, especially when you look at biologists who were not necessarily allies of the eugenics movement, like Dobzhansky, who nonetheless published in eugenics journals mm. and is held up today as a, no, he wasn't a eugenicist, and you go, but it was accepted at the time. So I th your point about not drawing that artificial boundary where it wasn't seen at the time is a really good one. Yeah. Do other folks in the audience have questions? in the middle section. Felicity, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks again for a, a wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering if you know of, um, was there contemporary pushback um, against the sort of uh, eugenicist narrative from the academic sphere? Was there a recognition of the sort of danger that these kinds of ideas um, had and, and perhaps uh, early showings of the kind of way we think about eugenics now and, and, and the way we condemn it, um, was there a sort of recognition of, oh no, this is actually really horrible, um, or was it just sort of accepted as part of these kind of blurred lines between um, science and the societal implications? Yeah, thanks, great question. And really important question. 
Um, so, yes, there absolutely was pushback. And so I think perhaps to, to kind of, it's really good that you answer that, ask that question right after that answer, because I wouldn't want to give the impression in saying that, you know, eugenics was part of a legitimate scientific discourse, I wouldn't want to suggest that it was, that there was wholesale support. Just as in science today, there's a huge amount of discord and disagreement and consensus can be hard to come by. Um, there were anti-eugenicist um, scientists. You mentioned Dobzhansky. He's a bit of a um, kind of a gray area case, but somebody like Lancelot Hogben, who was a contemporary of, of Fisher and actually Fisher and Hogben hated each other. Uh, one, one reason being their very different attitudes to eugenics. And that's maybe another reason as well, apparently, anecdotally, why he hated this cover of his book, um, because the anecdote goes that he opened up the, the case of the new books when they arrived and said, oh, it looks like one of Hogben's, and kind of threw it aside. Um, oh, I'm off the... But basically, I think... It's important to pay attention not just to the people who supported eugenics, but really important to pay attention as well to the people who opposed it, and there were many. Not only within science, people like Hogburn, people like Haldane and Julian Huxley, who I've mentioned, had some kind of nuanced critiques of eugenics whilst not wanting to fully, um, to, to fully break with it, um, but also outside of uh, science as well. Some of the recent work I've been doing is on the history of eugenics at Oxford, the institution where I'm based now. Um, and that's looking not only at the extent to which eugenics was supported um, by staff and students, but, but also opposed. And interesting findings of um, students writing in student magazines and newspapers, um, basically taking the mick out of eugenics. Uh, trying to expose how ridiculous it is and how pompous and elitist and classist it is um, in, in, in a kind of fun-poking way. So not necessarily um, the kind of resistance you might expect to find, but there was resistance in many places, in many ways. And, and that is particularly important, I think, when we're having conversations about you know, whether to memorialize or, or cease memorializing people. And for those who want to continue to memorialize these figures, they might say, and they do say, this was a man of his time. Everybody agreed with him. So how can we single this person out? Not everybody did agree. And so that argument doesn't quite hold, in my opinion. But thanks, great question. Yep. Really important point. I'm really glad you brought that up. The the disagreement, so thank you for the answer to the question. Do we have another question? Yes. To what extent uh, are the ideas that he was putting forward in 1919 new sort of novel thinking in this field, or mm. is he parroting things that were already being said? Mm. Yeah, great question. Um, a mixture, so of course he's not the first person to identify the this phenomenon of recurrent collapse of civilization, civilizations through history. Um, so he's operating at a time when people are kind of quite obsessed with that idea and uh, with trying to forward various historical explanations for why that happens. What's novel or what's, yeah, what's different in Fisher is his explanation of um, differential fertility as owing to um, heredity. People, eugenicists were, you know, looking at census data and noticing patterns and patterns that they were uncomfortable about, dysgenic patterns, um, over fertile, poor, and, uh, and less fertile middle and upper classes. But they, there was no consensus on how to explain that, but usually it was some sort of environmental or behavioral um, explanation. So something about living a middle or upper class lifestyle meant that you had less children, but they were kind of vague on why it was. And so Fisher's explanation of um, the social selection of fertility, it was 
novel in its generality, but the seed of it comes from Galton and his theory of uh, heiresses um, and infertile heiresses as um, contributing to uh, fewer children being had among the aristocracy. And Fisher kind of took that and really generalized it and built this theory of, yeah, civilizational collapse across history um, in this kind of grandiose way. Wonderful, thanks. I think we've got a question in the middle. Felicity, thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah, thank you again for your great talk. Um, so I've kind of got a two-part question. I hope that's okay. Um, a question of two halves. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, so to what extent do you think that you talked a lot about how eugenics has kind of fallen out of repute in academia as well as in, in the public. To what extent do you think that's because of the science being refuted, as, as you talked about how heredity, um, fertility isn't necessarily heritable at all, um, versus just in, like kind of political embarrassment? So, yeah, to what extent do you think those two have determined its fall in, in repute? And kind of on the back of that, to what extent do you think eugenics really is dead and gone? in terms of support for it. Thank you. Great, thanks. Excellent question, questions. Um, and yeah, really nicely identified, I suppose, a couple of key competing historical theories there um, for the decline of eugenics. So either eugenics went away because the, the bottom fell out of it scientifically, you know, um, or because it no longer was uh, politically ex expedient to um, to support eugenics in a in a changing world, um, and it's a it's got to be a mixture of the two. I I think that the uh, but but those two questions are so related to one another because the 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 death of eugenics or the decline of eugenics is really a sort of an artifact in a way of actually disciplinary reorganization. And so a lot of the questions that eugenicists were interested in, scientifically speaking, before the Second World War continued to be asked, but just in different places by people working in different kinds of departments under different disciplinary headings, um, whether it's human or medical genetics, demography, social mobility studies. And so, what goes away, it's not necessarily the, the scientific core of what eugenicists are interested in doesn't go away. Um, genetic determinism or some kind of simple-minded sort of uh, Mendelian explanations of, of uh, hereditary diseases or something like that, perhaps they're no longer part of cutting edge science, but they continue to have a very um, lively kind of public circulation. Um, and we continue to read about, you know, the, the gene for whatever it might be has been discovered. And then if you speak to a, a geneticist, they say, oh, well, of course, it doesn't mean actually that there's a gene just for this, but you've got to pay attention to context and environment and development and all of these other things. Um, but nevertheless, that kind of genetic de determinist discourse is still there. So, yeah, does it make sense to say eugenics went away? I think it makes sense to, to differentiate between the ideas, which I think are still, still persist, and the institutions and the infrastructure, which was, to a certain extent, dismantled, transformed, repurposed, repackaged, like we saw with the renaming of journals, the renaming eventually of learned societies. Um, and so the, the, the extent to which eugenics in the interwar period had built up a recognizable and distinct disciplinary infrastructure, that was taken apart and redistributed. But the ideas, they didn't just suddenly go away. Very good, very good and informative information here. I feel like I'm learning a lot. Does anyone have any other questions? Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Just a quick one. Um, Fisher had eight children, two boys and six girls. That's right. 
Is, is it recorded anywhere that this was his attempt to um, do his bit for eugenics? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, kind of indirectly. So Fisher, there's a, there's a letter, um, an exchange of letters between Fisher and Leonard Darwin, son of Charles Darwin, who actually, a work by Leonard Darwin is out in, in Sarah's display. Leonard Darwin was uh, president of the Eugenics Society. He was much older than Fisher, but he, he sort of took Fisher under his wing. He spotted him as a young man, as a very incredibly talented scientist and also a, a very committed eugenicist and, uh, and made sure that he, he continued to cultivate his eugenic interests. When Fisher had, I think, his, either his sixth or his seventh child, Wrote, wrote this long letter to Leonard Darwin about a whole range of things. And then in the final paragraph, he just says something like, oh, and, and the, the seventh baby has arrived. All well. Best, Fisher. Um, and Darwin replies, you're really doing your thing for eugenics. Uh, and there are other examples of, of people responding in the same way. So while I've not seen Fisher explicitly saying it about himself, other people said it about him and he didn't, um, he didn't refute it. Uh, there's, a, there's a nice piece in the, I think it came in the Daily Mail sometime in the 30s. Um, yeah, it was sometime in the 30s, not too long after the genetical theory was published, and it's a little piece where they'd been talking to Fisher. Uh, Big families hereditary um, is, the, is, the, is the headline, and then the tagline under is mentions Fisher and his eight children, um, and showing you know showing his kind of eugenic zeal. So yeah, it was definitely an idea that was floating around at the time. I saw an interesting piece in the in in a newspaper recently, uh, quoting Jacob Rees-Mogg, saying <laughs> broadly similar things. I think uh, he you know I've had X number of children, I've done my bit. Now you do yours, sort of idea. So yeah, absolutely. On that note, I think it's probably time for us to wrap up. <laughs> Take that information and do with it what you will. Thank you so much, Alex, for a wonderful lecture. Really an honor to have you here. Please join me in thanking Alex one more time.